Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. All right, here's one that happened to me, but I never tell it because it's very unexplainable. And people always just say I'm lying or was high or something. Be me. Living with my then girlfriend in a tiny little place above this old couple's garage. The fact that it's the second story comes up later. Sitting on the couch watching TV with my girlfriend. Don't remember what we were watching or doing before that. I realize now looking back on it that I was in a kind of mental haze. Like when you're in a dream and you don't question how you got where you are. You just go along with it like your brain is in compliance mode. My girlfriend starts asking me questions, but the whole time she's looking forward in the TV with a really serious, annoyed look on her face. It's really weird because she was an airhead and never serious or angry about anything. I don't remember all the questions, but some were pretty random, like... What's your name? Um, it's Anon. I'm your boyfriend. Remember, we live together. I kept trying to laugh awkwardly to lighten the mood. She's like... Your full name? What is it? I tell her and she keeps going on like that. Really weird questions. Have you ever broken your bones? How many? Do they ever break by themselves? LOL what dot JPG. Can you see well in the dark? What do you use your eyes for? For some reason, I just kept answering like I can't really explain it. But I just didn't think to question her. Not like I was scared of her, but more like when you feel too awkward to not go along with the situation, like when someone mumbles something and you say what? Then they mumble again and again, and eventually you just say, yeah, because it's too awkward to ask them to repeat themselves again. Some of the questions didn't make sense at all or were grammatically incorrect and made them sound like she was speaking English as a second language or was reading them off a page or something. She's English, by the way. Things start getting weirder and or borderline unintelligible at times. Do you sink in the waves? The ocean's waves? Do you sink in them? With cat's claws? Can you cat's claws? Do you love sound? Eventually I get up and say, I'm gonna go get some more chips from the kitchen. Do you want anything? She keeps looking forward and goes, No, sit. I look at the kitchen. It's normally really close. Remember, this is a shitty little apartment and everything is about five steps from everything else. It looks like the kitchen is about five miles away. The kitchen light is on, but it looks dark like the lights are really dim and the bulbs are about to explode or something. The whole path from the couch to the kitchen looks really dark and scary and elongated like how your passage looked when you were a kid who was afraid of the dark and you had to go pee at night. I'm suddenly terrified by the idea of going all the way to the kitchen alone and I just sit back down next to her. She keeps asking questions. Eventually she starts asking about my dad and seems pretty interested about him. Does your dad love you? Is he a holy man? I'm like, my dad's not a priest, you know that, he's a lawyer. She just keeps going. Is he a fisher? No, sweetie, he's a lawyer, remember? Is he a fisher of men? After this, she starts asking questions faster without a pause in between, so I can't even answer if I wanted to. The whole time, she's just staring at the TV, looking more and more annoyed. Did you move from here? Do you eat fish? Is your hand on fire? Does fire hurt you? As I'm sitting there wondering what the hell I do now, there's a knock at the door. I'm so relieved I just want this conversation to be over and I'm starting to feel a bit more lucid. I'm starting to wonder what's going on with her. I go answer the door. I pull open the door and my friend is there. Hey Anon, ready to go? The moment I see my friend, the fog is completely lifted and I'm completely aware of where I am and how strange this conversation has been so far. My friend was coming over to pick me up to go to the pool hall and have some beers because my girlfriend was spending the night at her parents' house out of town. I take a few steps back to look around the corner at the TV and couch. My girlfriend is gone. I start walking towards the couch, my friend's just standing there like, bro, do TF? I'm standing there looking at the couch like I'm expecting to see her hiding behind it or something. The TV is off. A faint movement outside the window that's near the couch catches my attention. I put my face against the glass and look down. I can't see anything because the lamp is on and it's dark outside, so I'm just looking at my own pale face. Turn off the lamp, look out again, look down at the garden. Nothing. Notice more movement higher up at eye level. I looked down at first because we're on the second story, so I was instinctively looking for something on the ground level. I noticed something floating across the street almost already at the trees. 
I live across from a little wooded area, not an actual forest or anything. Think more like Central Park in New York, just a little bit of bushes and trees to help the city breathe, but it does eventually fade into a few open fields and eventually an actual forest. I can see a figure floating into the tree line. It looks like a silhouette of a thin but wiry, muscular sort of man. He's got no wings or anything, he's just floating away. He might have had more features, but it's twilight and the light's pretty faded at this point, so it's pretty hard to see him in great detail, though. Sometimes a shaft of light from between the trees hits him, and he looks like he's crimson-colored. The blood-red color mixed with the muscles make him look like someone who's been flayed alive. The worst part was that he was holding a woman by the hair in his right hand. She was dangling there like a dead body, dressed like my girlfriend, or whatever the hell was sitting next to me. The woman's body is turned towards me. The mouth is agape and the expression on the face looks like somebody who's been getting their fingernails pulled off for the past few days. At first I thought she had huge black eyes. My face when she actually has no eyes at all. That's when I noticed the body looks sort of flat. Closest thing I can compare it to is like a hyper-realistic blow-up doll that's been deflated. I didn't realize it at first. I only saw it for like two or three seconds. But now looking back on it, I think it honestly looked like a human suit. I try not to think about it too much because it really makes me anxious. But I really feel like that floating thing was wearing her like a suit. And when it was done, it just carried her away. Holding her the way you'd hold a jacket when it gets too hot and you have to take it off. The logistics never made sense to me because there's no way that thing could have fit inside a body as small as my girlfriend's. Although that whole sequence of events was so murky that I could have been sitting next to an elephant and maybe I thought it was my girlfriend. I called my girlfriend like five minutes later and she was fine. Never had anything happen to her the whole time she was with her parents. My friend didn't see anything but he seems like he actually believes some parts of my story. Just because of how scared he said I looked after I pulled my face away from the window. Everybody just says I was high or something but I don't do drugs, never have. And I hadn't had any alcohol that night. I was waiting for my friend to arrive and we were going to go out and drink. You and Ons want to hear my inner woods experience. I've got it typed up so it won't take long to post. I might not make it through the next week so keep an eye out for headlines. It wasn't a self-termination. Bit of quick background first. Be me. Mid-twenties, just finished college, live in the mountains of North Carolina with deep woods, pick related. A bunch of random hills and windy switchbacking roads at the bottom of the Blue Ridge Parkway and before country roads. Be not me, girlfriend. Most women in the area that aren't from two specific counties, Meth County and Yuppie County, are actually all right. Something about actually having to make a living tends to make people a bit harder. Both of us are avid hikers, and the trails and sights off the parkway are perfect for day-to-week-long camping depending on where you go and what you want out of it. Right, you can turn your ears back on now. Just finished college, about a week ago. Did okay. I'm graduating in about a week, and decided to celebrate. Going to celebrate by some late-year backpacking. A bit cold, but not bad. A lot of walking and then camp at a couple of semi-traveled sites that are empty due to the time of year. Going well so far about a day and change in getting ready to set up a tent and fire when we catch a bit of a whiff of something dead. Probably a deer or squirrel or something not unusual for this area. Figure it's just something that got coyoted recently, and not to worry about it. Have some homemade candles that I layered with used engine oil into in my pack. Works great for discouraging bears and coyotes, and I'm packing my dad's 357 in case that doesn't work. Only needed it once to date. We set up and start making dinner. Get you a gal that can cook over a campfire, lads. Nothing quite like it. After dark, staying up for some snuggle time, need to get a touch more firewood, or it'll end up a little cold toward the end. 43 Fahrenheit low that night. Girlfriend starts to disrobe and tells me to hurry. Yes, ma'am. Walking back along the trail. Left the 357 with her and tagged my blue pack light on so she wouldn't shoot me on the way back. Had an armful of easy pickings when I started to smell the squirrel or rabbit or whatever again. Must have been closer than I thought. Get a couple more sticks and head back. That should keep it going for another 20 or 30 so good enough. Turn back. Passing the spot where the smell was... I don't smell anything, but before I can register that I hear two shots. Drop sticks and run back to camp yelling for her. Get to camp and she's alive, but has a glazed expression and is not very responsive. I think she's a little shell-shocked or something. This wasn't her first trip, though. And ask her if it was a bear. Yeah, bear, she says. Still looking dazed, but I put it down to shock. 
get the gun back from her and reload it. Two spent as expected. Decide screw it, bedtime, dump the last of the wood at camp on the fire and light the candle. It's a little acrid, but if you do any of your own mechanics, you start to become friends with that shop smell. We start to kiss, but she seems a bit not in the mood at first, but warms to it quickly. Next morning, she's still a bit stiff, but seems better, so I make some eggs and start packing. She comes out of the tent, butt naked, and it's still 48 degrees with some minor wind. She doesn't seem to mind. Most of you Anons will have put two and two together as my caveman brain started to. Tell her while attempting to keep a cool head that we need to go ahead back to the car, so she better get dressed. Blank expression never changed while she says, yeah, and starts to get dressed a little jerkily. Haul ass while trying to keep as calm as possible on the way out while she walks almost silently behind me. Manage to get back to car and drive quick as hell to town. Drop girlfriend of at her house, figuring that if she asks where we're going I might be wrong, and she doesn't. Drop it off and make my excuses saying, I'll pick you up tomorrow, and it somehow buys it. I've seen her around a bit since then, despite trying to ghost her, and she usually has a creepy wide smile on so I figure it's only a matter of time till it tries something. I might try and take it out myself. I can't shake the feeling that this thing let me get out of there. But it did seem genuinely confused when I dropped it off so I don't know just how clever it is. Maybe they do this to small couples, what do you Anons think? I know there are legends of Fae and such seducing mortals and or kidnapping babies etc. Is this how they reproduce? Anyway, if I don't follow this up, assume it got me. Be me. Meet a cute older Navajo girl. Dated her for one and a half years till she passed away. One night she asked me to meet her in the woods for a camping trip. Bring extra clothes and on I'll need it. I show up set up the tent where she said and wait. Night falls, I get worried and started looking and yelling for her. Hear twig snap. Turn around. See a rabbit. Oh, okay, just a... Her face pokes out from between the front paws. I almost shit myself but she says it's just her and it's fine. She gets out of the rabbit like she had a blanket or towel over her. Completely naked but painted up head to toe. I was obviously shocked by her appearance and her ability. She shows me the skin. It's a legit rabbit. She asked for the extra clothes. Everything goes well. She was happy to see me. I dated and wanted to marry a skinwalker. So this has been going on for the past month and a half. Not sure what I'm dealing with and hope X can help me figure out what is going on. Start seeing girl after finally getting over a bad breakup. Super bubbly and extroverted city chick. The type who fakes being country cause cowboys are so cool. Somehow mesh well and go on a few dates. She's new to the area and wanted to see what all there is to do in the area. About two weeks in, I took her on our fourth date. She and I are going hiking far north of Idaho in the mountains, hike going well for a good long while. A fog low cloud rolls in out of nowhere, and we get separated because she had gone to the bathroom. Start calling out to her but get no response, staying put because I don't want to get lost in the fog cloud. Super bad sense of impending doom pulsing through me. About 40 minutes later the fog had passed, head off in the direction she went, managed to find her about a mile off where I was super quiet and doesn't want to talk about what happened. Shake it off as she's probably just scared about being lost. Remain super quiet since. Whenever we talk, she uses short sentences. Text messages have gotten super dark, like making jokes about wanting to eat people who annoy her. Have her over for dinner one night. Make venison backstrap with roast carrots and baked potatoes, as well as a salad. She only eats the meat and says, not rare enough. I cooked it rare. I have the next day off. Get a message from her. Hey Anon, want to go hiking again? Say sure. Grab my 6.5 Grendel rifle, put my Glock 32 and IWB holster in my waistband, throw my backpack on and pick her up. She's visibly off put by rifle despite the fact she should know I have it and I have let her see my collection. Hike trail for a bit. She grabs my arm and points off the trail. Follow her. Takes me to this beautiful spring a couple miles back in the woods. I literally never heard of this place and I have lived here for years and she has been here a little over a month at this point. Grab some food out of the backpack, offer her trail mix, refuses. Grabs beef jerky out of the backpack and eats all of it. One full pound of beef jerky in like a minute just scarfed down. Tell her it's time to head back as it's getting dark soon. Doesn't want to leave, doesn't say anything, just stays there. Start walking back, get about 100 yards away. Turn around and still see her standing in the spring. Keep walking. 
sense of existential dread returns. Unsling the rifle and keep walking. The feeling of dread is getting near unbearable. Start running back to the main trail. Hear footsteps behind me. Stop and turn around expecting to see her. Nothing. Yell out. If you're screwing with me, you better knock that off or you might catch a bullet. The woods are dead silent. No sound. Nothing. Not even the leaves rustling. Hoof it back to the trail as fast as I can as the sun is below the mountains and there is barely any light. Make it back and she is standing at the spot where we broke trail. Looks at me and says, have fun? Still high on adrenaline. Ask her how the hell she made it back before me. Shrugs and gives me a very unsettling smile. Tell her I'm leaving, with or without her. Start walking back to my rig. She grabs me in a hug and says, stay. Tell her I'm heading back with or without her. Reluctantly, she follows me back to my rig and gets in. Since then, she has still asked me to head back to the woods with her to hike and camp. We've hung out in person once since then, and she didn't say anything to me aside from wanting to go back to the woods and complimenting me for cooking steak right. Literally, bloody red. She also still sends me those odd messages about wanting to eat people like loggers in the forest and things that annoy her. Are there like any forest spirits out in this area or something? What am I dealing with here? It doesn't seem right for someone to basically just change into a completely different person. Might go back with a few friends and heavier ordnance. My grandpa was big on spook stuff and has 3030 and 357 magnum rounds loaded with actual silver bullets. Silver seems to give a lot of spoops bad days, and if it did kill and replace her, well, I feel I should do something about that. Only other thing I can think of is maybe something is wrong up there, and whatever it is actually needs help. In which case, more dudes can help better than just me, or I'll die. Definitely gonna see what I can find in the area and see if I can get in touch with my old Native American history professor, since she is from a local tribe and super into Native spirituality, going so far as to burn sage before every class to remove negative energy from the room. Who knows if I will actually get anything out of her, though. OP here for possibly the last time. Managed to get a hold of my Native American history professor today. Her best guess as to what it could be is that it is a tree person. They're spirits that inhabit the trees that can take on human form. They are usually found around sacred springs and sites. From her description, they aren't necessarily malevolent, but will do whatever is necessary to defend the sacred place. If I were a betting man, I would guess that when the girl I was with went to go to the bathroom, she happened to be in a sacred site and well, but that is just a guess. It would also explain her knowledge of the spring despite not being here very long, as well as the fear of firearms since a lot of people around here blast trees in the forest for target practice and the hatred for loggers. The only things I don't have answers for are the fact my professor said that they are supposed to have a horrible smell as well as the fact they don't like being seen in human form by people, although that may be why she constantly wants to be in the woods. I almost wonder if it feels bad about what it did. I've decided, though, that I'm going to ask her directly the next time I see her. I'll be around to answer stuff for a bit, but if I go dark suddenly, well, I'm probably serving as nutrients for a tree in a sacred site. Status, OP, and before you get eaten by the imposter. Alive. Sorry I'm a social worker who works overnight till 5 a.m. As such, I usually don't get up till like 1 or 2 p.m. Currently, I plan on driving to my dad's house and grabbing my grandpa's silver bullets and 30-30 today. Have tomorrow and Monday off and plan on going to investigate where I lost her originally with a buddy of mine who was former infantry to see if we can find anything that might look like a sacred site. If so, I plan on leaving an offering, per suggestion of my professor to whatever was there in hopes of seeing if the original girl is still alive and can be returned. Hopefully I can appease it if she accidentally pissed it off. If I can't find anything at the fog site, I might try the spring if I can find it for the same reason. I have a really good memory when it comes to remembering locations in the woods, but with things like this, who knows if there is magic or something required to find it. Half of me wants to invite it along too and just straight up ask what it really is and what's going on and explain my intentions aren't to hurt it or anything in the forest unnecessarily. I still hunt and use that meat as my main source of food for the year, and that I just want my friend back or the truth about what happened. The other half is not really fond of turning into lunch for something I didn't believe in until recently. The one thing my professor and I are both unable to answer is why is it having this much contact with me of all people? I'm about the furthest from Native American as you can get since I am only a second generation American. Whatever happens though, I'll try to give a major update on Monday assuming I'm still around. 
Also going to start using the name Panhandle Anon for future posts in case this goes down. Well, today is the day I go out to the spot where everything originally happened. I'm not really sure what to bring as an offering. I am leaning towards some venison backstrap. But if anyone has better ideas, let me know. I think the best way to go about the offering is to build a small fire and burn the venison and some sage with it. But again, I'm not entirely sure. Haven't heard anything from my professor on what kind of offering is best, so those are just some thoughts. I know I definitely don't want to make it more angry. Unfortunately, I was unable to make it to my dad's for the silver 30-30 rounds due to the risk of spreading the Rona. So here's hoping I don't need them. I've got a 3006 and a 35 Remington to cover larger bore rifles, as well as a few 5.56 rifles to choose from. Definitely going to strap my Glock 32 while I'm out there, since I have seen firsthand what a 357 SIG will do to an animal. Not entirely convinced I need to bring an arsenal, as I really don't feel it's malevolent, and don't want it to feel the need to attack me out of fear. On the other hand, I don't want to go in defenseless. Plan is to go in there today, set up the camp, get the offering ready, and hike out to the location where she original disappeared to make an offering, then wait overnight. If that doesn't work, I'm going to the spring area and see if I can find it again. If I'm not heard from by Tuesday at 6 p.m., I'm probably dead. If I get answers or come back empty-handed, I will report when I know. Whatever she is now, it likes you too. Absorbing memories means eventually the two of them can synthesize GF and spirit in one body. Of course I'm biased, I've done a lot of work with the Fae and ate some raw porcupine liver last night. I don't eat much, but raw meat is super juicy, I compare it to berries in flavour. When I butcher venison, I eat tender bits from between the joints as a treat while I butcher. The stuff you can fillet out easily but isn't worth saving otherwise. I understand it's abnormal, but to me it's only a bit odd. Maybe it seems odder to others than us. The change in my preferences did start around the same time I first was contacted. I'm quiet because I'm processing information and considering how to phrase and when to say whatever is important to convey at the time. Maybe she's a forest spirit who chose you as her guardian and your woman as her host slash confidant. If I'm correct, your GF is still alive, just working out cohabitation with a sprite. Godspeed Anon. Take more pictures and probably give us a hint of the place so we could send Van Helsing up on your trail. Far North Idaho Woodlands. Don't really want to give more details, as the more I think about it, the less I want it to die. Even if it is a predator, I am in its territory, touching its things. Sure, I'll defend myself if I have to, but in the end, it didn't do anything truly wrong. Now, if it is a purely malicious entity, things change. But I have gotten good at reading people and their body language as a result of my job. As stated above, I am a social worker. I don't get malicious vibes from it. If I am wrong, well, I guess I just overestimated my abilities and paid the price. In the event I don't come back, I'll have a friend post coordinates for the location of the first site as it is probably malicious. I grew up hunting. I know what you're referring to when butchering a deer. My grandpa also told me to always leave the heart behind as a sort of thank you to the forest for providing the animal. It was some kind of Bavarian tradition his family instilled into him and he passed on to my dad, uncles, and I. I just never questioned it. Not like I was going to do anything with the heart anyways. Nothing will happen, by the way. Her and it are fused. One entity. If you call that it killed her, then it committed self-termination when it did. She's a butterfly, the dog was the cocoon. Probably lasted longer for them than you. Don't waste the backstab. Give her the offering directly. Also land is female. Call her she for both corporeal and incorporate states. Calling her it is antagonistic. Anyway, you want to do this right, here's what you do. Candlelit dinner, dear heart cut as medallion steaks, basted in olive oil and surface fried in a pan. Think black and blue steak, but a normal sear on the outside, not a full char. Then when you've sat her down to eat, you ask her about the spirit that entered and they'll tell you how it happened and what it is like. They agreed to the merge, likely without excessive coercion. She'd probably tell you any time she's probably silent in part because you haven't commented on her or behavior even though she knows you should know something is up. Just say it. The heart just puts her in a good mood. Convenient connection error showed me your post before mine. I had the dinner recipe posted before you acknowledged you already know how to do it right. This is why you were chosen for a landwife. Late start today. Started puking my guts out as soon as I got home from work. Didn't fall asleep till like 8 a.m. Oh well, time to do this. 
I don't intend to antagonize her by using it. It was just a way to differentiate the two. While it might be the case that she is a forest spirit, I want to rule out other possibilities. Bit of an update as plans have changed a bit. Buddy and I both decided that he shouldn't be around tonight. Whatever it is, is interested in me. Him being there might dissuade her or others from showing up. So I took him back home. Also, couldn't use venison as the last bag I had left in my freezer was freezer burnt. So I used chicken breast as it was all I had available. After the hike to the spot, we spent the rest of the time setting up camp. Picks to follow. We'll be going out again soon. Camp I will be staying at tonight. Impromptu shelter someone left there was half destroyed when we arrived. Former resident also left a camp toilet. The scariest part of this whole situation was opening that lid. I will never be able to forget that. Assholes also left a bunch of trash, hauled it out when I took my buddy back home. Not dead guys. Sorry to disappoint anyone who was hoping I was. If you want the short spark notes version of what happened, they are not hostile. At least not without reason. Here's what happened. Pick from the drive back out. Drop my buddy off and head back out towards the campsite. Arrive around 8 p.m. and start a fire. Heat up a can of Chef Boyardee in the fire. Start whittling a spear out of a piece of firewood while I wait for it to cook. The food is hot, so I put my project down and start eating. Finish eating and hop back in my rig to watch a movie I downloaded on my phone. The phone dies at around 9.30 p.m. No worries, brought my guitar as a way to kill some time. Also, figure music is usually considered a universal language. Play blues and country music for a bit. It's all I know how to play. Not sure what time it is, but I start hearing flutes and drums in the distance. Not really in time to what I'm playing, but seems to me that it is trying to be a response to it. The sound gets closer, almost deafening near the end of it. Consider grabbing my rifle, but I decide against it as I don't want to be seen as hostile. Fire goes out. The fire was still high and burning bright but went completely out. There wasn't even any heat coming off of the coals. At this point, I think, maybe they aren't friendly. Grab my rifle and chamber around. Flick on my mag light and start scanning the tree line about 150 yards away. Maybe a dozen figures dart out of the light or turn away from it. Some appear to be holding clubs, and others have what look to me like either short bows or long claws. Rifle at low ready yell, Hello, who are you? No response. My name is Panhandle Anon. Do you have a name? I'm not going to hurt you. A couple that have turned away cock their heads to the side, similar to the way a dog does when you ask it who's a good dog. At this point, I think that maybe the fact I had the rifle put them on edge. Set my mag light on the ground. Take the magazine out, eject the live round, and toss the rifle on the ground to one side and the mag to the other. I still have my Glock 32 in my waistband. Pick up mag light. See, I don't want to hurt you, I just want to talk. One of the figures starts walking towards me. Its gait seems normal to me, just really long strides. As it gets closer, I realize just how massive it is. I'm about six foot four and this thing is easily seven feet tall. It stops about 50 feet away from me. Why did you come here without telling me? The voice is animalistic and sounds almost like a snarl. Without telling you, are you the one who I found in the woods that day? Look away, I do and a few seconds later I hear her voice tell me to turn around. She's standing in the clearing where I set up camp. Yes, why did you come here without telling me? I wanted answers, I think you could tell I was suspicious of you. I have to know if she's alive. She has returned to the earth. Through her actions she desecrated one of our burial sites and was unrepentant. So I take it that my offering was a wasted gesture. It was appreciated, but there is nothing that can be done for her now. Do you have a name? We gave up names when we came to the forest. What are you? It is not my place to say. I'd like to know. She yells something in a language I don't understand. Four figures come walking out of the trees and into the clearing, but stop about 100 yards away. Turn off the light. We don't like it. I'm trusting you here, I say as I flick off the light. I hear them walking towards the camp. My eyes have finally started adjusting to the lack of light. She arrives first and sits down on the stump by the fire pit. A few seconds later I can see the figures standing behind her, trying to stay calm at everything I am seeing and hearing. The five are talking in a language I can't understand. Finally she speaks up. They have allowed me to tell you. They were originally from a tribe called the Amakis. With the bit of research I have done since coming out of the woods, 
They appear to be one of the various bands of Kootenai Indians that were here prior to white people settling the land. According to her, instead of agreeing to go to the reservation that was formed in Montana, they fled into the woods. While there, they called out to their deities for protection and to stay on their land. The response they got was the ability to turn into trees to hide from those settling the land, the ability to control nature, more on that in a bit, and change to take human form as a way to either throw off followers or lure those that want to cause harm to the forest to their death. Why'd you agree to tell me this? Because you are not like her, huh? I don't follow. You were with her. We thought you were like her. We thought you were also looking to desecrate this forest that day and wanted you to answer for it. I wasn't planning on it. I like being out here too much. This forest is where I go to relax and clear my head. I could tell from my time and conversations with you, though I told the others they were unsure. Your offering, though unnecessary, showed them that you are willing to show respect to this place and try and right the wrongs caused, even if they were not yours to right. Thanks for that, I think. So I'm curious, what exactly do you look like? It's kind of hard to see without any light. She whispers something over to them in their language and they all start conversing for a few seconds. Look away, she tells me. So I do. While I am turned around, I feel heat and see the glow from the fire. You can turn around. The best way to describe what they look like is to picture the texture of tree bark, but with a tanned skin color. Their hair was like huila, basically Spanish moss, but for the north. As far as I could tell, there was nothing differentiating males and females. To me, the most distinct feature about them was their pure black eyes. Thanks for trusting me enough to show yourselves to me, but I have to ask, am I going to be free to leave? It is painful for our kind to be seen in this form, but you are welcome. She starts talking with the other four again. They are clearly arguing despite the fact I have no idea what they're saying. After a while, the largest one in the group speaks up. Take her hand and close your eyes. The voice sounds like someone with a stoma trying to talk. One second. Since I don't think you're going to hurt me, I feel I can get rid of this. Don't worry, I won't try anything. I slowly remove my Glock and holster from my waistband and set it on the ground. One with a deep voice lets out what I can only describe as a chuckle as branch-like claws extend from his hand, then retract. They say something in their language that I can't understand, but my guess is that it was something like, you aren't the only one with a concealed weapon. I take her hand and close my eyes, as far as the skin goes. It feels kind of like tanned leather, not unpleasant by any means, but nothing like human skin. I feel wind whipping against my face. A cacophony of noises assault my ears, suddenly stillness and quiet. She tells me to open my eyes. I'm in what appears to be a cave. There are a couple lit torches illuminating the room. At least 50 of them are in the room. A very tall one approaches me, has to be over eight feet tall, holds out a wooden bowl. They tell me to drink it. I look over at her and she nods, think to myself, well, it's been a good run. Take the bowl and drink it. Whatever it is is bitter, but also kind of sweet. As soon as I finish, my whole body feels like it is on fire. I don't really remember what happened after that, but I came to in the cave. Several of them are standing over me. You survived. We are surprised. The spirit of the forest normally does not allow that. One of them says, what did you put in that? It is best you do not know, she says. The tall one walks over to me. The forest has accepted you as one of its own children. We will honor the forest and accept the decision. I'm sorry, I don't know what that means. You have been blessed by the forest spirit. So long as you do not desecrate the forest, you will be protected from any of its inhabitants and keep its blessing. Okay, will I know when I have? What will the punishment be? You will know and the forest will take you back, now go. She offers me her hand. You do not have to close your eyes this time. So this next part may seem hard to believe, but they are able to bend the trees to make portals or something that they use to quickly travel from place to place. Step in with her. Almost instantly back at camp, several of them are looking through my things. Stop as soon as they see us. The four who came forward originally come through the portal behind us, start yelling at the others in their language. The others just drop everything on the ground, yell something back. They thought you would be dead. Walk up to my things. The rest of them kind of shuffle away from the campsite. Apparently they realize something is different. Come closer again. She tells me it no longer hurts when I look at them. We talk for a while. She translates for me. 
show Claw Hand my rifle and Glock, and explain the basics of how they work as they seemed interested in weapons. After I finish talking to Claw Hand, she asks me about the music they heard, open the back of my Jeep up and retrieve my guitar, start playing. One of the four stares at the fire and says something. Fire starts back up immediately. A couple start playing flutes and one plays the drum. The rest start dancing. Invited to dance. Politely declined since I couldn't dance if my life depended on it. She looks sad. Okay, you win. Laughter breaks out as my dancing makes Commander Shepard look graceful. You were better at playing music, she says, giggling. This goes on for what feels like hours. Eventually they get tired and begin to leave. Invite her to stay up for a bit. Switches back to human form. We talk in the back of my jeep for a while discussing how things have changed in the world and human culture. Will you come back and visit? As often as I can, I have to work and winter's coming soon. The woods out there can get upwards of five feet of snow and even my jeep can't get through that. She nods. But you are more than welcome to come by if you can make it. You know where I live. If you need a ride, go to diner and call from there. Wrote down my number and handed it to her. So I have to ask, do you want a name? I feel odd not knowing what to call you. She stares at me a bit, then nods. Hmm, why not keep it simple? Just take her name. That works for you, right, Abby? Not her actual name. She nods. Eventually, I must have just gotten so exhausted from everything that happened that I passed out. Woke up and she was gone. I don't plan on giving out the location of all of this, as it's clear they just want to be left alone on their land. I don't know if it's the same for everywhere else, but if you are in the forest and see unnaturally stacked rocks or mounds, don't touch them. Those are considered sacred, at least to the Amakis. As far as the nature-altering powers go, as I understand it, each one has the ability to affect a small area around them, but in greater numbers they can affect larger areas. Don't know what the blessing does aside from the protection, if it even does anything else. I'm not sure what, if anything will happen with Abby and I. I plan on telling my professor what happened and maybe see if she can get a hold of someone who knows more about this kind of stuff so I can talk to them. As of now, I don't feel any different, aside from the image of that toilet burnt into my memory, but we'll see how things progress. I wouldn't tell your professor these things are meant to be kept a secret. Well, got some free time tonight as work is slow. Going to answer a few things based on what I have learned over the last couple days. Technically, she is a former professor as I graduated a few years back. That being said, I had no idea what was going on and needed someone who might know advice. She was the only one who I knew that might have any idea, or who would know someone who did. Lucky for me, she did know someone who I have been talking to. Not to mention even if I did, I have nothing substantial to take one out with. Judging by their traits and performance over the years, I am thinking they would just laugh off the puny 22 revolver I got laying around. Keck. From talking to people, I can say that it depends on the region. The three main ones I know of, though, are white ash tree ash, ground sage, and a couple other ingredients turned into a paste and can be used. Just make sure to research what you are dealing with and use the right species of sage and the corresponding components. Mountain Death Camas is another one that can be turned into a paste and used. There are a few others based on different regions as well as substitutions that can be used in extreme circumstances, but those three are the most common I've learned about so far. Research your area and find people in the know. Whatever you do though, don't just use trial and error. If you aren't sure, don't do it. You don't want to just piss one off. I wish I could help you more, but I'm still far too new at this and am currently getting a crash course. Interesting. How do you think they exist? Breed? How did they evolve? Did the Native Americans know of them and work with them, or did they fear and fight back against them? Why the hell are there so many monster that explicitly mimics human voices near perfectly cryptids, like these flesh gates in the world, on our planet? In other cultures and continents, too. Basically, the short answer is human actions. There are some more benign entities that were created by the Great Spirit, but for the most part it is our actions, be they good or bad, that can lead to becoming one. Not sure about breeding or the mimicry. I know that depending on the entity, Native Americans would either work alongside them or hunt them. Locally to me there are the Stick Indians. There are a few stories of Native Americans hunting and killing them because they would kidnap their women. However, as a follow-up to the Stick Indians, 
There are also a few stories of their children being raised or cared for by local tribes. And when returned to the Stick Indians, they would provide aid to the tribe. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time.